Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither PhilStockWorld.com PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective officers, personnel, representatives, agents or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation or offer of any particular investment, security or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not the service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right, now we're good to go. It's going to be an exciting day, i tell you that much. Um, we got um, the Fed coming up at 2 o'clock. Uh, we have some bounding, you know, gains in the NASDAQ again, gains in the uh, S&P. Everybody's gaining, gaining, gaining. Oil's way up. Gasoline is way up. We we were shorting gas at 212. It's popped over 212. I still have two shorts there. I got a bunch of shorts on the NASDAQ, which are underwater. Um, my average is around 72.50, and we're at 72.70. I'm honing on. I mean, there's September shorts now. We're into the September contracts at this point. Uh, those are the NQM8s or the ESM8s. Everything is M8. And uh, no, I'm sorry, but sorry, sorry, sorry. U. U8 is the September contract. The M8s are the ones that we just got out of July. So all these things are a little bit higher than they were because it's now September and not July. And the sentiment is generally bullish. I mean, people think it's going to be a good summer and that the indexes are going to be higher than they are actually now. Um, the Dow, for example, is at, I'm waiting for it to roll around on NBC, but it'll tell me in a minute. Um, the Dow is at 25.3. Oh, that's weird. I was just going to say how this thing is optimistic, but it's not optimistic. Well, the S&P is at 27.87, and the futures are a bit higher at 27.91. But the Dow is actually at 25.3. This is really reflecting exactly where the Dow is. So on the whole, the futures are not having a bullish sentiment at the moment. Only the NASDAQ has an insanely high sentiment. I mean, just crazy the expectations for the NASDAQ right now. Um, here's Tesla. I've been watching them because we were looking for a good chance to short. But let's look at Apple, which is way more important to the NASDAQ. Apple, as, I, as I've been saying, we're getting towards at about 202, which is up here. Um, that's the $1 trillion mark. And if the market doesn't have second thoughts about a single company being worth a trillion, even though Apple, if any company is worth a trillion, Apple is. But if the market doesn't have second thoughts about Apple being worth one trillion dollars, then I give up. Then I, I mean, then, then you have to say we're into like this 1999 bubble and you just may as well bet on anything that isn't up, bet it'll go up because that's the only direction the market seems to go. Um, it's one, is it one o'clock? It is one o'clock. We can look at the um, the more detailed API reports. Let's do that. I got to move things fast because I want to be like ready for the Fed and we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Unlike most days when we have nothing to do. <laughs> so today we got a ton of things to do. Uh, da, 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 da. He forgot his pants. I don't get that. Nice tie, no pants. What on earth? Are you guys watching me? <laughs> so I, don't think, I don't think I'm broadcasting an image, but if I am, then I apologize for the tie and no pant look. Um, <laughs> anyhow, let's get a, you do believe me, you don't want to see me in a tie and no pants. <laughs> Even in a tie and pants, it's barely passable. So let's not like, uh, start, let's not start breaking things down. All right. Um, ah, yes, EIA. God, it's very, so much stuff. All right. Uh, petroleum status report, petroleum, spelling fundamental status, 
weekly petroleum status report. So, you know, at 10.30, the crappy report comes out, which doesn't tell you anything, but at 1 o'clock, the detailed report comes out. So we always like to look at the detailed report to see what the hell actually happened. There was a huge draw in oil today. Um, wow, imports were even up. Wow, imports are down 4.4% than last year, but but week over week they were up. Um, commercial crude or oil inventories increased by 2.1 million barrels. What? What? Ending June 1st, this isn't this week's report. I was going to say that's not what we heard at all. <clears throat> it is after 1 p.m. I don't get it. See if I can refresh. Well, this is very strange. I don't know much we can say here because they haven't actually put up the uh, the new thing. Wow. You know, the, I don't know if we noticed. Oh, did we do? We didn't do a webinar last week. Look at this build in other oils. They went from 410 to 417, 7 million barrel build in other oils. This is why you can't trust the inventories, because they don't tell you what happened to all other oils. So, in other words, these guys are producing oil. They're producing the same amount of refining. The refinery activity is the same, 10,230, 10,152. The refinery activity is essentially the same from week to week. Very about Almost the exact same gasoline production, the same distillate production, the same oil inputted to the refinery, there's virtually no change. What's the variable here? The variable is 7 million barrel build in other oils. So it's the refinery's choice to produce distillates, they produce oil, they produce gasoline, they produce distillates, and they produce other stuff. But when they produce other stuff, it doesn't get counted. And that's huge. So they can they can create a false uh, a false looking demand for oil because they say oh look we had a draw on oil and we had a draw on, I'm sorry we had a draw on gasoline and we had a draw on distillates but you had a draw on gasoline distillates because you didn't produce enough and you produced other oil that nobody wanted this is how they can totally manipulate this market at will because we react to a million barrel build here a million barrel draw there when it's a, a rounding error. It's 140 million barrels a week, and you're talking about a 1% variation that moves the market. It's completely fake. Let's always keep that in mind. Everything that happens here is fake. It has nothing to do with reality. The reality is we have 1.8 million barrels of oil in storage, and we use 20 million barrels a day. Therefore, we have... Um, 90 days worth of oil sitting in commercial inventory. Now, even if OPEC cut us off, they only export about 2 million barrels a day. So that would take us uh, uh, 182 million. Actually, it's 1,800 million. So it would be um, 900 days. So it would take 900 days for us to draw down our inventory because OPEC cut us off. That's number one, 900 days. That's a lot of like three years. Number two. If everybody cut us off except Mexico and Canada, that still wouldn't matter because we're only importing 5 million barrels a day, and that's pretty much all from Mexico and Canada. All right, also we have to look at what we're exporting. We're exporting a phenomenal amount of oil. We're exporting 2.5 million, not oil, but we export the petroleum products out of the country. That also fakes a draw because 2.5 million times 7 is 14 plus 3 is uh, like 17 million barrels. We're, we're essentially exporting an entire day's supply of oil. So 15% of U.S. quote, quote, demand is actually us exporting to other countries. That's not our demand. That's other people's demand added to our demand to make it look like we have more demand. It's a complete and utter sham, everything going on here. So just always be aware of that. Don't ever take this stuff seriously. Refreshing again. It's not changing. I don't know what's going on. I, I don't understand why the highlight is not the highlight. As explained, blah, 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 released after 1 p.m. 
click on it and last week I am stumped actually it's not even last week is it this is the 13th so this would be through yeah that's about right so this would be like through the 8th which is Sunday okay but meanwhile it's not there I have no explanation More discussion about my pants. Now talking about my underwear. Boy, you guys. <laughs> so you guys can see each other's chat, or are you just all spontaneously talking about my my pants and underwear and ties? That's kind of weird. <laughs> I, I was under the impression you couldn't see each other's comments. That's why I keep reading them off. Anywho, since nobody has anything else to say, I will go on. All right, so we're waiting for the Fed. We want to see how everything's doing. Let's take a look at the futures charts and see how things look. As you see, everything is coming up roses at the minute, looking all very good and strong. Uh, the dollar is looking very weak. Last I looked, see the dollar is down. Oh, this is like a daily chart. That's not helping. Look at the dollar. The dollar is plowing lower from 93.80 to 93. 17 that's six tenths of a point but it's only 10 percent of a hundred so really it's more like seven tenths of a point of a drop since yesterday so since yesterday's close this is down seven tenths of a point what does it do when the dollar drops it mass weakness everywhere else so in other words everything is priced in dollars so if the dollar drops seven tenths of a percent in value automatically Stocks and commodities should go up 7% because they are commanding uh, they're commanding a certain amount of dollars, right? So how do I say this? Okay, look, if a bar of gold is worth $1,000 and the bar of gold is a static thing and the dollar drops 5%, well, then you need $1,050 to buy a bar of gold, right? Because the bar of gold didn't change, the dollar changed. So the same thing applies to a stock, which is priced in dollars, or to a, a commodity, any commodity that's priced in dollars. Uh, if the price of, if the value of the dollar drops, then you simply need more dollars to buy the same thing. So you get this artificial push to the indexes, an artificial push to commodities when the dollar drops. So basically, you've got a seven tenths of a point handicap on the indexes, and still. They are not up seven tenths of a point. The Nasdaq is basically just keeping up with the dollar. The Russell is failing by a mile. The Russell is down ten percent against one percent against the dollar. The Dow is down seven tenths against the dollar. The S and P is down six tenths. Take the dollar because it should be seven tenths higher, and it's actually only one tenth up. In the energy side, we're matching the dollar. This is not an exciting build. It's matching the dollar. All right, and we, but we, we can't figure, we, for whatever reason, we're not getting the proper report. We don't know why oil and gasoline is such a heading up, but it's a penny higher than we thought it would be. We were, we were looking short of this 212 line, and I said tight stops above, but of course I didn't follow my own advice. Let's go getting ready for the webinar, though. You, you guys cost me a lot of money in this trading stuff, let me tell you. All right, 10 year notes waiting for the Fed are fairly flat. Now, here you need a bigger view. So, in the long run, we, we bottomed out at 11850. Now, if the Fed's tightening, these notes should go lower. Okay, I don't know why they pop back up, and, and I don't know why they're holding up here, but but in theory today, the Fed should indicate something that puts these things below 1850. So we'll see what happens. That's about the 3% line for the 10 year. And here on, on the on the longer range, you can see that we're really it's really just a, not even a weak bounce off of this drop. In fact, here you go. So let's use the 5% rule. So we're coming down from 127, right? And we're falling to 119. So that's an eight-point drop. If there's an eight-point drop, then a bounce would be 20% of the drop, which is 1.6. So 119 and 1 1.6 is 120.6. So right there is a strong bounce line. Is a, I'm sorry, right there is a weak bounce line. The strong bounce line is up at... Uh, 122. Basically, 122 is a strong bounce. Is a strong bounce line. See how it failed that and went plunging down. See, so we 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 would have we knew that already basically. Um, so seven points is roughly roughly a five percent drop too. So it's a five percent move down. 
We have not even a weak bounce because the weak bounce is here, 120.6. So we don't even have, we had a total failure of the weak bounce line. And now we're coming back down to test probably, test 119 again. And below 119, you're into like completing uh, at least a 5% cycle. So where's my calculator? Ugh. Is it never set up the way I want them? All right. So um, what do we say? 127 times 0.95. So 120.65. Well, we blew that already. Oh, that was the 5. It's, oh, that's interesting. So 120.65 was the 5% line. And now, and since we, so what happened is we, we, we overshot the 5% line by 20%. This happens in the 5% rule too. You look for the overshoot, 20% of the run is an overshoot. 40% of the run is a big overshoot. Um, then the bounces are the same. So they're all the same lines. So the actual line is 120.65. We went all the way down, shooting down 20% more than 5%, essentially a six point drop to 119. Then we bounced exactly to the 120.6 line basically. And failed that, and now, so now we're actually completing, now we, so now we're gonna to look to complete a 10% run. So here's gonna be the cool part, you can go back on this video later, I'll tell you, I'll predict the future. So 127 times 0.9 is 114.3, all right? So minus 127 is 12.7 times 0.2 is 2.54, so, we're gonna have two and a half point bounces off the 114.3 line. So call it 114.5. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm very free with my rounding in the 5% rule because first of all, I made this whole thing up so I can do whatever the hell I want. Second of all, it's not a freaking science. There's not a test tube and a beaker here to tell you this. It's just roughly what's gonna happen when these computer programs start trading against each other. These are the crossover points where the computers start kicking in. That's why we can predict them so accurately because we have a totally computer traded market. So it's very easy to predict what the computers will do. So basically 114.5 is a 10% drop on the S&P 500. So when it hits that line, we, we've completed the fall. Now you can have an overshoot of 2.54, of 2.54, that'll take you down to 112. So 112 would be the same kind of overshoot we just had here at 119. But even so, the bounce line off of 1143 is going to be two and a half points over it. So like we say, call it 1145. So it's 117 is going to be a weak bounce. And guess what the strong bounce is? 1195. So 1195 is a major point of contention for, for the on both the 5% and 10% drop. But since we're failing that, it's a very, very strong indication where the next stop is going to be 117 after the Fed. And after that, we're going to go all the way down to 114.5, probably 112. And it's going to be an ugly, ugly chart and an ugly drop. And look at the 2%. The 2% is not waiting. The 2% uh, the 2%. The two-year note is not waiting. It's already making new lows. The two-year note doesn't have to wait and hear what the Fed has to say. It's like, I know where things are going. It's going down. So that's where we're at on that one. Uh, I'm gonna give you another shot because it's on the first thing on my list to do and it can't be done. Ah, finally, ho oh, ho, June 8th, okay. <clears throat> Clear my mind and start from scratch, okay. So what we have here is commercial crude inventories decreased by 4.1 million barrels. That is incredible. How did 4.1 million barrels disappear? Um, uh, inventory is lower half of the range. Total gasoline decreased by 2.3 million barrels. That is amazing. That is a total of 6.4 million barrels of draw. How about distillates? Distillates decreased by 2.1 million barrels. Now we're into like 8. Point, what do we say? 6.4. So it's 8.5 million barrels last week. What could have caused an 8.5 million barrel draw? That seems like a lot. Well. First of all, um, we, we added 7 million barrels of other oils. Well, that took care of that. And we're still exporting a ton, although not more than last week, but we're still exporting quite a lot of oil. 
But the big difference here is all other oils, 7 million barrel build in all other oils, giving you a very, very false picture. Product supplied, they supplied the same amount of product as they supplied last week, but they put another 7 million barrels into other oils. And that's where it's going. It's not real demand. And that's why I'm sticking with the shorts. Okay, this was what I figured. I expected this, but this this bears it out. We have another 7 million barrel build in all other oils. There's no change to anything else, no change to the SPR or anything else. And the total inventory, the net inventory, which is a real number you should be looking at, is 9.9, .9, right? Goes down to 8.1. So there's a 1.7 million barrel actual draw, yet they're reporting an 8.5 million barrel draw. They report to you an 8.5 million barrel draw when they know damn well it's only a 1.5 million barrel draw. It's all total bullshit. Not to be taken seriously. So more, more oil went into the refineries, but not really that much. Only a couple hundred thousand more barrels a day. Utilization is up, which means some refine. Now, see, this utilization is up 1%, but the refineries are not producing not, not one bit more. They're producing no more distillates. They're producing no more gasoline. Now, if a whole refinery came online, if, one, if we had an increase of 1% capacity, yet no additional oil was produced, what the hell is going on in this country, huh? That's kind of weird, right? So it's not demand. There's some hokey business going on here in the background. So, you know, all these other numbers are the same. The product supplied are about the same. Actually, it's a 300,000 more. So about it's almost 2 million barrels more product were supplied. But they basically went to other oils. The only thing that's not counted is where they put the oil. It's there. And remember, it's their choice. The refineries are the manufacturer. They take the raw oil as an input and they turn it into product. They turn it into gasoline or distillates or other oil yet they never report the other oil number that's because it allows them to manipulate the figures any way they want and I, and and i have told press people this over and over and over again why does it do that i like adblock pro details this extension contains malware oh that's bullshit <laughs> All right, how do I get rid of that now? Come on. Adblock Pro contains malware. Um, yeah, it's malware against uh, your advertisers is what it is. All right, anyway. So where were we? So that's, all, so that's where we are. So, so, you know, it's nonsense. Now, it's coming into July 4th, so it's not the best time to be shorting anything. So I don't think it's like a great, great short. But July 4th is still way out here. And the expiration day is here. Well, not really. Let's see. Three business days. So it's going to be um, one, two. Oh, it's going to be the 20th. Okay. So the 20th should be expiration day. So there's five days left to get uh, to, to line up for the, new, for the new contracts. I think there should be at least some kind of sell-off. And there's nothing, nothing supportive about what just happened today. It's just all reacting to bullshit, basically. But meanwhile, we're at 113 on the bullshit. So what can you do? Um, let me see. I'm going to go to um, my trader. I am going to, I have two shorts. They're down a bit. I'm going to probably add to it. Let's see. I'm going to add. Let's see if it'll take this. Oh, it took that right away. All right. So now my average is 212.18. And now, see, it's 212.78. So if I do another one here, it's like 60 higher than where I am. But it's not going to move the needle much. So it's 60, 60 hundredths higher than where I am. So all it's going to do is add about two to all four contracts. So um, I, I don't think it's worth it. I'm not going to add one now. Although, although honestly, I don't think it's going to go over 213. But um, I, I just raised it to 212. So now I have three contracts at 212 and a bit so 212 maybe right well i can see it 212 right here 
And when it gets back down to here, I'll go back to maybe one short or two short, and I'll see how it rides out. Meanwhile, I'm down 3700 bucks on my NASDAQ shorts, so I'm a little more concerned about those. But I, 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 I don't know. I'm going to be very surprised if the markets go up on the Fed, which is coming up in a half hour. So let's see if we have any questions. Ooh, then we have a lot of questions. All right. Jow says, can't see any other people's comments. So coincidentally, a couple of people are talking about mind order, huh? <laughs> We can't see each other. I guess I said something and then somebody said something. That's why. Um, anyhow, all right. I'm the op ed. Uh, oh, wait. I'm, uh, Mike says, I'm an option opportunity member, not receiving the morning report or just truncated. Is that report included in my subscription? And if so, how can we receive it? Well, well, Mike, um, I've been having an issue with seeking alpha lately. And uh, here, the gist of it is Seeking Alpha wants me to only promote the options opportunity portfolio. Uh, I don't work for Seeking Alpha. Seeking Alpha doesn't pay me for my articles. Um, they, they, we share the revenue from the options opportunity portfolio, but I'm not, that doesn't include what we have at PSW, Phil Stock World. Um, so the gist of it is, essentially, we're having an unresolved argument, and I think what's going to happen is I'm going to um, no longer participate at Seeking Alpha. Um, I, I mean, they're just, I, I, I don't want to get I mean, I'm really sickened by the whole site, so the, and especially the way the editors treat the writers. But even so, the fact that, like, anybody can write on that, on that place, and now it's like a pump and dump sort of thing. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm kind of um, disassociating. So what's going to happen is Greg is going to contact you. And if you can contact Greg, Greg at BillStockWorld.com. Um, Greg is going to contact you. And you will be able to get a basic, uh, a basic chat membership at Phil Stock World for the same price you're paying for your OOP membership. Okay, so that's going to be well, – that's how we're going to take care of the OOP members for now. Um, I, I, I'm almost certainly not going to be offering any more portfolios at Seeking Alpha, working with Seeking Alpha's marketplace or anything else. When you're at Phil Stock World, you have access to everything, including our other four portfolios. And you get to participate in chat, which is like asking me questions anytime you feel like. Um, it's, it's, it's a way, way better deal. We have more control over it, and we can provide you with a better product. So on the whole, I, I just... You know, I mean, the Seeking Alpha thing has been an experiment. It hasn't been a very good one because I can't stand the way they run things over there. Um, so it, it looks like it's probably going to wind down and come to an end. So that, that's where it is now. You know, the answer is obviously with the morning report, we provide it to Seeking Alpha. They just censor it and edit it because, God forbid, I should say something is Trump's fault. That's it. Can't be published on Seeking Alpha. You know, it's it's if I oh, and also if I talk about a trade, here's the other thing. If I talk about a trade that wasn't originated on Seeking Alpha, they won't publish it. So basically, they want me to write an entirely new article every morning just for Seeking Alpha, pretending that that's the only site in the world that I would ever be on. And it's bullshit and it's fake and it's half assed. And this is what all these writers put up with to be on the site. It's not worth it. It's, it's a joke. And it's sad because they have so much traffic. They built up such a reputation on the backs of people like me, who still has like the most subscribe, one of the most subscribers on the site of any author. And I, but I had those guys before Seeking Out was even popular. That's what I brought to them. But, but they've used me up now. And they're like, they, were, they, they only care about promoting themselves. And, you know, obviously they've got their own pressure and they've got to do what's best for them and try to make their own money. But, it's a it's not good it's not a partnership at all it's a indentured servitude over there so that's that's what's going on but anyway that doesn't really affect the report that's not why i'm not withholding my posts they just choose not to publish them most of the time because god forbid i say anything that is unfriendly not if i say something unfriendly seeking alpha like hey they censored my last post so you didn't see this <laughs> Or if I mention Donald Trump, basically, even they, even if it's not even that negative. I mean, what what if such a pretend he's not president? Act like they they want me to act like politics is not a factor in investing. Um, 
it's it's insane. Anyway, so you'll be much better serviced coming over here and being a basic member. Um, and that's so that's where we're at. And that's going to happen very shortly. Greg is going to reach out to you as soon as it's finalized. But I'm telling you, that's a basically looks like the way it's going to be going. I very much doubt there's anything that's going to save this relationship now. And uh, you can reach out to Greg now and just say, I'm done with them and I'm coming over. That's fine. All, all you seeking out for people can do that from the options opportunity portfolio. Just say, boom, we're, we're switching. Come over to Greg. He will take care of you and make sure everything is seamless. Uh, Phil, since a long weekend, all right, three says, since a long weekend, I've been on the road driving a lot. I notice people completely clogging the roads. Normally after a long weekend, it cools off, but I'm not seeing that anymore. I noticed a record number of vehicles with yet to be registered tags. Not sure how what that reflects. It does reflect a lot of new car buying, and we've seen some good numbers from the automakers. It reflects a lot of new jobs. You know, we, we, are, we are at full employment. Everybody who wants a job has a job. Um, you know, my, my kids at the beginning of the summer did not actually understand what help wanted signs were. You know, they're 16 and 18, and in their lifetime, they haven't actually seen, or, or in their in their cognitive lifetime. I mean, I imagine they were help wanted signs in 2006 and 2007, but but you know, they were too young to notice. But in their in their adult lives or in their church, whatever teenage lives, they've never seen or contemplated the idea of a, of a business wanting people to work there. They figure people just work places. It's weird. I, I, I mean, I, cause, cause you know, I, I must be the worst father. Cause I got I interrogate my kids about all sorts of stuff. So I'm having a whole economic discussion just because they asked me, just because they accidentally asked me a question. They know this too. They're very careful. Sometimes they're like, well, we've been not saying anything. Our dad will start lecturing. Um, but you know, they, um, they, they said something like, you know, like, well, what's up with this sign? You know, what's this help wanted sign? I mean, you know, why can't they find people? And I'm like explaining the entire socioeconomic thing of the United States and how it goes and what job situations are and so on and so forth. But the bottom line is, yeah, <coughs> everybody's got a job. And not only that, though, but Trump is kicking out all the illegals and making it hard for them to get jobs, you know, under the table. It's very hard to get under the table. It's not just that he's kicking out the illegals. It's that he's kicking out, uh, he's making it very, very difficult for someone without papers to get a job. You know, used to be you could easily hire some people off the books and no big deal. Now they're cracking down on that too. So that means you've got to find a, an American who's willing to work at your place. So that's why you see like Wendy's with constant, like, you know, help want and Burger and constantly help want. They can't possibly. How are you going to find people to do this stuff? Where are you going to find Americans who are going to mop the floors and do the, and clean the kitchen and so on and so forth? It's hard to find people like that. And, uh, and teenagers don't work anymore. They're not even in the workforce because they it used to be, used to be, I didn't know anybody who didn't have a job. Like you didn't go, you didn't say to your friends, do you have a job? When I was in school, this is in the eighties, but I mean, you know, when I was in high school, you didn't go to people, do you have a job? That wasn't a question. It's like, where do you work? That was boys, girls, everybody. Where do you work? Everybody worked. And we were we were up and middle class in my school, too. I mean, we all had jobs. You worked. That was the way life was. Um, kids don't work anymore. They get they get insane. First of all, they get way more homework. I mean. I had intended to force my girls to work, but I got to tell you, they have such a ridiculous amount of homework. I'm like, I don't see how they could possibly have a job. They get so much more homework than we used to get. Um, and, there, and there's always this test prepping. I think the school sucks these days, but that's beside the point. Anyway, so, um, you know, with everybody having a job who wants a job, that means everybody has a car who wants a car. So there's no people who say, well, I can't afford a car. So a lot, a lot of people have gotten new cars, a lot of new cars, because we talked about this for years, actually, that we were in a very big down cycle. Um, we were in a very down cycle for cars for a long time, like from 2008 or nine until 2012, essentially not nobody, but nobody bought a car, you know, like hardly any cars were sold in America, uh, probably half or less than half of what was normally sold. That's just pent up demand because the cars you have are still getting older. So just because you didn't buy a new car doesn't mean you don't need a new car. It just means you put it off. And so all this put off demand is now catching up and people are buying more and more new cars. So that's why you're seeing this kind of stuff. And the same thing is going on with vacations. There's a backlog 
of vacations because there's so many people who haven't taken a vacation in years. Why? Scared of losing your job because if you lose your job, you can't get another one. People were scared to ask for a vacation because, God forbid, you were the, you, you were the low man on the tail of and job. They'd fire you in a second. They can get anybody they wanted. Now they can't find work. So now you go to your boss, hey, I've been uh, I mean, take two weeks off. And they're like, oh, okay, because <laughs> the boss knows you can't be replaced that easily. So we have a pent-up demand for vehicles, a pent-up demand for vacations. People haven't taken vacations. I mean, ask your friends. Ask, you know, Well, not if your friends are rich, but ask, ask, ask your middle-class friends. Like, when, you know, how many vacations have you actually taken in the last 10 years? And people, people are going to tell you. You'll hear a lot of people say, well, geez, I'm not anywhere, but now I'm, I'm – I'm planning this and I'm planning that. So there's a lot of catch up there. What what blows my mind is how quickly the consumers switch back to SUVs. They're all, all SUVs. Like nobody's buying economy cars. Nobody's buying the new electric cars. It's all SUVs. It's unbelievable how fast people just forget about the five dollar per gallon gas and go right back to the consumption um to the uh to the um to the consumption sort of um oh i can't think of the word to the to the consumption levels boy that was a tough word right they go right back to the consumption levels we were at in 2008 where everybody's filling you know filling up cars to get 15 20 miles a gallon we we, we have gotten the fleet average up over 30 miles a gallon and everybody's now buying the 20 mile a gallon cars. It is so stupid and so short sighted, but that's what's going on. So, what are you going to do? So, in part, yeah, you say, well, that goes back to gasoline demand, right? Yeah, it's true. Over a long holiday weekend, we did have a lot more draw than we had in previous years because people are using more gas guzzly cars. More people are driving those gas guzzly cars. Um, but it's not an overall real spike in demand. You can't extrapolate the holiday demand for what's going on. And on the whole, the fleet average is still significantly better than it was. So it doesn't matter how many new cars you sell. Every time you sell a new car, it gets better mileage. Even a new SUV gets better mileage than the old SUV. So it doesn't, it, they, from a demand standpoint, it's not going to help gasoline. Uh, it's every time as we refresh the fleet and bring newer and newer cars online, they get better and better mileage. Trump is attempting to do away with those mileage standards. But until he does, we're still on that constant path to use less and less gasoline. Can you look at SVU? Oh, yeah, I like I, I liked SVU, but when it came back around in January, I, I didn't I chose not to um, to renew it. It just um, well, first of all, they'd run their course. So that that's one thing. So you're saying, uh, Naomi, uh, this was a stock last year when it was low in the channel. Now it's high in the channel. I agree with that. We, I have a 15-20 bull call spread January with a 13 put, and it's over the 20 line, but only 50% of the 5,000 in the money. Whew, that's a lot of things, right? All right, first of all, let's take a look at SVU. And as usual, I don't have my little charty thing up, so I'm going to have to find a charty thing. Not that, that. I'll make a new window. Oh, look at H&R Block. Wait, i got to close your question box again. Look at, that's it. It, went, it was up here, and now it's down here. If you want to get back in, in the um, options opportunity portfolio and in the long-term portfolio, we bought back the short um, 27 calls. We had, we had 27, we have a 20, I don't know what we have, maybe a 22, 50, 27 bull call spread, something like that. Um, no. What do we have? Now i got to find out. Oh, your kid. Oh, no, there it is. Long-term portfolio, H&R Block. HRB, the 2227 bull call spread. So we have a 2227 bull call spread from January, um, and we sold the 25 puts. <coughs> so now it's below 25, but we still have the 22 calls that are way down there. So we're not worried. And, and it's going to get back over 25, so we're not worried about that either. They just they, they gave poor guidance because they're spending a lot of money to update their systems, and also they project a softer demand for their services as the new tax bills are a bit easier than the, than the old ones were to fill out. I don't think it's going to change much. I think people who are inclined to uh, pay $100 to have their taxes done are still going to pay $100 to have their taxes done. I don't think 
that's the make or break for them. But they're they're being cautiously um, cautious in their outlook. Um, it's just ridiculous. This is a ridiculous overreaction to uh, what the, they said. And plus, their earnings were smashing. They had fantastic earnings. So it's ridiculous. But that wasn't what we were looking for. We were looking for <laughs> SVU. All right, we're going to call this a sidetrack show. I'm very easily sidetracked. All right, let's see. Um, SVU, of course, way up here. I think we liked him at like five, didn't we? Am I crazy? Wasn't SVU like five bucks or something when we were buying them? What do they split? Did they did they reverse split? Lost track. Seems seems odd they'd be at twenty. Yeah. So, oh, here it is. Okay, split one for seven. Oh, ha <laughs> ha There you go. That helps bump them up. All right. So they had a one for seven split. So it was even lower than five. Um. So what's the bottom line with SVU? So um, the, the PE says 17, $700 million. So they should be earning 50 million bucks, basically, a little bit less. So let's see where they are. And they are earning 50 million. Look at that. I'm amazing, aren't I? They're earning $49 million. <laughs> I don't know. Look, sometimes I impress myself. So I just yeah, I'm like, I look at something, I'm like guessing. Oh, 50 million bucks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. This is why we didn't go back into them because they're earning $50 million on $14 billion in sales. That is not a good story. It's not exciting. Um, to, to some extent, uh, the, the earnings are whatever they want them to be. Because, you know, they, it's a very thin margin business and they can attribute a lot of things to a lot of things. But the bottom line is like, like here, look at this net income, $650 million. So to me, the, the potential was there, but they never realized the potential of where they are. And I wasn't happy enough with where they were going to, to be in. A, plus, Amazon was buying Whole Foods, and that makes a whole new kind of competition at a lower price. And Walmart's pushing the groceries. So there's a lot of reasons I, I didn't stick with it. All right. Anyway, so your question was, or no, it wasn't sticking with it. We had already sold it. And see, see that's the thing. We sold it at, um, we sold it in December when it was up here. Now, I considered rebuying it in, in February when it was down here, but I, again, we basically just kind of lost interest. We said, yeah, you know what? We caught a good run. That's that. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad stock, though. So you're saying you have the January 15, 20 spread. That's a little aggressive for me. Um, I mean, they are 20, so you're in the money. And a 13 put, I'm not, I wouldn't worry about a 13 put. So uh, there's nothing much to do. <coughs> You're saying you get 5K, so I guess you have 10 of them. Um, it, that's all it is. As long as they hold 20, you're going to make 100% on your 2500 net dollars. So I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it, is that not enough? Is it not good to make 100% between now and January on a, on a spread that's already in the money? I, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's good. Uh, let's see. And then Ian says the IQ pricing, the STP review is for the 1935s, not the 2035s. And then he says, never mind, they figured it out. Okay. Um, hopefully that means it's okay. Uh, I think I did that right. Uh, three says, last weekend drove, <clears throat> oh, this is back on the driving thing. Last weekend drove from Chattanooga to New Orleans to San Antonio, 2,300 miles. Just an idea of how much and where I've been driving. Also notice Record number of new pickup trucks. Yeah, it's the pickups and SUVs. It's insane. <clears throat> so, yeah, good and good. I love, by the way, I love actual observations. If people notice stuff when you're out and about and doing things, it's great, okay? It gives it so much color to what you're seeing. I don't know what's going on in Texas. I don't know what's going on in Chattanooga. Um, I was just in, of all places, uh, Albuquerque. So I know what's going on in Albuquerque. Uh, <laughs> but 
But I, you know, it's like, I, I love that because I file things in the back of my head. It's like the Fed Beige book, right? We talk, you know, here's a bunch of intelligent people who know about the market, understand investing. And when you observe something, it's valid. So please, you know, bring this stuff up to the group. It's always good. Uh, let's see what's going on otherwise. All right, good. So we got to that. We got to that. We got to that. Oh, I'm doing great. I'm recovering everything. How are the, how are the futures looking? We're still kind of just droning along. Freaking NASDAQ is still blasting ahead. Uh, the Russell is back on its feet here. Every, everything's coming up. Oh, that's weeklies. Um, silly me. Still, all, all looking very sharp. Nobody's really hurting right now. And now let's look at our ridiculously uh, profitable portfolios. How about that? <clears throat> Here's the long-term portfolio up 30, over 30%. That's a, that's a $150,000 gain, right? Yep, $153,000 gain since January. So, uh, well, obviously 30%. Um, look, I was wrong. Last, last week, we were up 25%. And I said, this is last week, last month. Last month, we were up 25%. I said, this is stupid. We should cash it out. And the only reason I didn't cash it out is because it's my job to keep portfolios and teach people how to trade. So it doesn't do me. It's not teaching you if I cash out all the time. So, I, but my my inclination was to cash out for the summer. My inclination is still to cash out for the summer, given that we didn't do that. All right. Well, wait. First of all, we, uh, how am I going to find it? LB. 524 is that when we did it or 523 probably the day before i want to i want to go back on something here because this is one very important thing that we said i don't i don't remember we covered it in a webinar or not but i i think this is probably a really important lesson so let's see if we can find it may 30th and what day is this one May 17th, wow, okay, page up, May 18th, May 22nd, what, what's that, since the dollar, okay, see, it's when I was on a cash thing, 69, look how far down, 68, it's a freaking 72 now. LB. All right. Victoria's Secret parent L Brands shares down on Outlook Cut. Shares of L Brands is our stock of the year, by the way. Fell more than 4% late Wednesday after the parent reported first quarter earnings shares above expectations, just like HRB today, but cut its forecast just like HRB today. And Elbrand said, blah, 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 blah. So numbers were great. Everything was great, but they cut their forecast a bit because they're realistic and they got punished. So, and here's me being sarcastic, as I get sometimes. And I said, LB, oh no, they will, <laughs> oh no, they will only earn $270 per $34 share. Why, God, why? <laughs> Holy crap, people. The reason we like them is because people are idiots and don't know how to value a company. Don't run and join them as soon as we hit a bump in the road. This was May 23rd. This is down here. See that little spike down? <clears throat> but it was getting back near the low. So it's very frustrating for the people who came in at the low and thought it was going up. And then all of a sudden it's right back down near the low again. And um, all right, so this is very, very important. So we're going to go through the whole thing. It's, it's critical to the way we do trading. Then I said the same with GE again, back at 14, where it's a screaming buy. GE is still 14, still a screaming buy. Everything I'm saying here applies to, to GE too. These are initially two-year trades, and sure, it'd be great if, like, THC or IMAX or SunPower or VRX or CMG, they took off in the first quarter and blew through our targets without any trouble. But it would be juvenile to expect that to happen every time. 
As much as it would be completely irrational and ignorant of the workings of finance to think that it's easy to make a 300% return on a trade just because that's your opening ask when you set up a spread. Like our original LB spread, as we set it up, was looking for a 300% gain. And, and boo-hoo, we didn't get it because it didn't go straight up. We came in in January. LB was one of, oh, well, where's LB? Blah, blah, blah. LB was one of our first picks. So we came in here or, or here. No, we didn't. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. We came in here at 40 because we waited. We did wait for the pullback. I didn't, I didn't rebuy. We sold our LBs here in the first round in December. And we waited and waited for them to pull back. We'll pull back all the way to 40. So they're down from 60 to 40. We were like, oh, yeah, I think I'm buying again. Um, if it were easy, then the premiums would be, now this is true. If it were easy, if it was so easy to make 300%, you wouldn't be able to make 300%. It wouldn't be offered. It's like, it's like in a horse race. If all the horses have three legs, except for the favorite, the favorite's going to be like one to one odds. Okay. He's going to probably beat all the three legged horses. That's easy to see, right? It's like, well, unless he falls, he's going to basically win the race because he's got one more leg than everybody else. Um, that's not how it works. Stocks go up, stocks go down. You've got to time it right. You've got to pick the right stock. You've got to understand the value. But no matter how good your stock is, it's going to go down. And no matter how bad your stock is, it's going to go up. It doesn't prove anything. The only proof is over time whether or not you get your trades right. And, and, and they're not always going to be right, so you have to adjust them. We go into a trade expecting to adjust it. Um, in our strategy section, Strategy, strategy, strategy. Ah, strategy. I knew we had one. In our strategy section, we also have a whole new members guide that tells you this stuff. Um, talk about entering a position and scaling into a position. And here's an entire other article on scaling in. And I talk about stupid options tricks, the salvage play. This is the principal way that we go into plays. We scale in. Scaling in means we take we have an allocation in our portfolio. I'm not going to go over the entire thing. Go in the education section, read up. But we have an allocation in our portfolio for each position based on the total value of the portfolio. We then take our allocation blocks and we divide them up into scales of one quarter generally. So every initial position is a one quarter position. Now, if I take a one quarter position and it goes up 300 percent, I'm going to get back. Um, oh, well, I put my foot in it. A one quarter position goes up three. I'm going to get 100% back on a full allocation block. Ha ha! But really, a 70, it's really a 75 cent gain. So, in other words, if I have a $20 allocation block and I take $5 and the $5 goes up, th goes up 300%, it's going to go to 20. I'm going to gain $15. I used five, so I'm getting, I'm only gaining 15. So I've actually gained 75% of what I allocated. So if a trade goes perfectly, I'm in with a small amount of money and the and, and I make 75% of the entire allocation, even though I only use 25% of it because it makes 300%. That's if it goes perfectly. That obviously doesn't happen every time. But honestly, our total portfolio performances are around 40% annual gain. So it happens often enough that it, that it, that it evens out in the end. Oh, so where were we? Um, up, 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 up. Yep, here. Okay. <clears throat> so in the long-term portfolio, we have $50,000 allocation blocks. Okay. And because it's a, uh, you know, it's a $500,000 portfolio. So it has a million in buying power. So we divide that by 20 blocks. And so we have $50,000 blocks in the long-term portfolio. We'll generally start out with a $12,500 risk position. So in this case, we were down, we were down almost 100% of our first allocation block on LB. And it was looking bad at the moment that was at this time, because mid-May. Um, and I said, currently, it's a $30,000 spread valued at $4,725. At $270 a share, let's say they're worth 14 times earnings. So $3,780. And at least 12 times earnings, so $3,240. <coughs> Um, is very fair. On the low end of guidance with each 10 cent now, each at this point though, each 10 cent beat adds another 120, which is now significant. 
any 10 cents above the above the low expectations of earnings of 270 a share is a significant beat. So now we've got this position where even in the worst case, it's still worth a lot more than the stock was trading at the time. Or I'm sorry, not, not what it was trading at the time. The time was $34. So at $34, I said 32.40 is really the floor. So I said, this is the bottom. I made a bottom call here and said, look, this is this is where we should bottom out. Right here at 34 bucks is about where we should bottom out. Because even if you give worst case, even if you take the worst guidance, so I took their new worst guidance. I took their uh, a terrible valuation of 12 times the worst guidance. And I put it in there. I said on the low end of guidance with 10. Now, anything above that guidance, if they're 30 cents above, it adds 360. So you're at 35.90. So anything other than this disaster at the low end of their range, and you're well over where we are now. I said, since our calls are 30s, it doesn't make sense to stay in for 32.50. Right? Since I think 32.50 is the bottom, now that we have 30 calls, I said, it doesn't make sense to stay in at 32.50. So we have to decide whether to fold and take a 15,000 loss. Now, remember, I was saying it was, we were down 11,000 here on the chart. It was, this was the night before, actually. It was 5.48 p.m. So we were down 11,000, and I was anticipating, based on the news and, the, and everything, that we'd be down about $15,000. So I said, we're going to take a $15,000 loss, and it's one-third of our $50,000 allocation block, but we can easily make that with a good investment, so it's not a big deal. You know, that's what I said. Because one-third of a $50,000 block means if we have another block, and it does well, we're going to make more than $15,000. If I have another $50,000 block and $12,500 of it makes 300%, that's going to make $40,000, $37,000 back. So I'm going to make back on one winner, I'll make back double what I lost on this one. So I, it's not like I'm in trouble unless I have, you know, four out of six out of 10 losers. It's going to be fine. But that's the point. We always take a very positive risk reward profile to our trades. And that way, we don't need that many winners to, to, to over, overcome the losses. Anyway, so I said, we can easily make back a quarter of the money. So that makes 300%. One winner wipes out three losers, right? There you go. It's simple. Or, and this is what we decided to do, we can spend $5 to roll the $30 call. So we're getting aggressive now. What are we doing in disaster? We still like the stock. I still think it's worth the money. So instead of instead of going crazy and worrying about it, I say, look, we're going to follow through with our plan. The stock got cheaper, so we're going to buy more. We're going to increase our allocation size from one quarter to one half. So we spend a bit more money. So here's what we're doing. We spend $5 to roll the $30 calls to the $20 calls. So we're rolling down $10 for $5. We're buying back the short $40 calls because they're useless. You know, I mean, doesn't they're, they're, we, we don't expect it to be at 40 anymore. I did the math up here. We're not going to hit 40. It's not likely. And we're going to sell 20 of the 35 calls. We still have a $15 spread. We originally had a um, $10 spread. Now we have a $15 spread. And we're uh, blah, blah, blah. So we spend $9,000. Not even a whole other, not even another eleven thousand, not even a full allocation block, which are twelve thousand five hundred dollars each, to be in the 2020, 2035 bull call spread with the short thirty seven fifty puts. We still have the thirty seven fifty puts that are short. Since we think it's ridiculously low, we could sell fifteen more of the thirty dollar puts for six bucks, nine thousand dollars, and then we're back to our original eleven thousand dollar loss on a $45,000 position, that's $36,000 in the money. So all it has to do now is stop going down and we're gonna get $36,000 back. And that'll change our $11,000 loss into a $25,000 win. If it just stops falling. That's at 32. Then we have, and we still have 10 calls uncovered be, uh, because of the ratio that we did here, and we can begin selling the July 35s for $1, dollar a thousand. Now, July was, you know, let's say 40 days away or 50 days away at the time. Um, 
we've got 700 days until the expiration of the 2020 calls. So if every if if every 50 days we sell a thousand dollars worth of premium, that means we're going to collect ten thousand or so dollars out of the cost of our spread. So the eleven thousand dollar loss we have because we've now taken a much lower position, more conservative, that has great leverage against the short calls that we're selling. So we've now turned our position into one that can make a, a regular monthly income and make back that $11,000, even if the stock goes nowhere. We're still going to erase that $11,000 loss. Even if the stock goes lower, we're going to erase that $11,000 loss. And if it keeps going down, we are still only at half an allocation block to do it again. And I said here, yes, we have to work at it. Yes, we're committing $20,000 to make $45,000 instead of originally $11,000 to make $30,000. So it's a little bit worse return. But now we're much deeper in the money. We started out with a 30-40 spread. Now we have a 20-35 spread. We've dropped our our calls 33% lower. We are much, much more likely to make this 45,000 than we were to make um, than we were to make 30,000. We're much more likely to make 45,000 than we were to make 30. So we've traded in some of the upside, not some of the upside total dollars, but we've traded in. So now, you know, so now we can make 25,000 before we could have made 20,000. So we can't make much more money. We put 10,000 more dollars in to make not much more money. So as a percentage, it's not better, but as a percentage given the chance of winning, it's much better. And I say that's a wider spread that's 90% of the money with a very good chance of success in a good position. And we can now generate a monthly income where before we weren't comfortable selling the short calls. Now we're very comfortable selling the short calls because we're deep in the money. And I said, that's not a flaw in the strategy. It's the design. This is how it works. Sometimes the stocks go straight up and we just make the money we, we expected to make in the first place. But when they go down, that's the opportunity to buy ourselves much, much better positions with all the cash we keep at the side. This is how it works. OK, so this is from. Um, May 23rd at 5.48 p.m. So if anybody wants to key, that's a keeper. I mean, I would keep that. And, you know, it's a very important concept that, that, you know, we have all these positions and most of them work out. So we never go through this process. But in LB's case, I, you know, I usually I often go into these positions. I would rather have them go against me first because I would rather buy more at a lower price than just buy my initial entry. Because when I buy more at a lower price, I make a lot more money in the long run. I mean money as in money that comes back. I don't, I don't only want to make $10,000. I want to make twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on a position. I don't want to have 100 allocations that do well. I want to have 30, 20, 30 allocations that make, a, that make a ton of money. It's a lot easier to manage for one thing. I mean, as it is now, we've got, holy crap, we've got 34 spreads like that in the long-term portfolio we've got four covered combos those are those are generally uh dividend paying stocks and then we got our short puts i don't count the short puts but let's talk about that too i made a point about this in the short-term portfolio in the short-term portfolio we sold thirty thousand dollars worth of short puts oh look at freddie mac doing good 20 percent already um Oh, and here's the LBs that we sold, the 35 uh, calls, because if you have more than four positions, it, it, it breaks it up. This, this thing can't handle more than four things. Um, so here's the LB shorts. They're down a thousand bucks, but that's fine. That means the rest of the position is doing good. And we've got forever to roll them. And we only sold 10, so no big deal. Um, where are we? Ah, so in the short term portfolio, we sold eight puts for. $30,000 and so far we're up about $10,000 on it. Okay. Um, this is, this is a, a, the, oh, 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 shit. Did the Fed come out? The Fed came out. Ah, all right. We'll get back to that later. <laughs> it's too late. The Fed says risks are roughly balanced. The market is trending down a little bit as far as I can see. Let's see. Yay. Oh, yes. Oh my God. Look at my NASDAQ. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh. 
Yay! <laughs> you guys, even gasoline came back. You guys should be thrilled. Oh my God. If you guys started up here where I when I was losing three thousand bucks, it's now plus two thousand, a five thousand dollar turnaround. Holy crap, that's fantastic. All they did is raise the rates a quarter point. They did exactly whatever. Ah, I don't. I don't understand how anybody could have thought they weren't going to do that. All right. Well, now, unfortunately, though, I can't count on it to keep going down. Oh, come on! Don't burn me. Don't do me like that. All right. I'm going to have to because I got so totally burned before. I'm going to have to be a little bit conservative here. Forty-two. So buy back another one. So I got to lighten up just so I have the flexibility. Forty-three. I'll buy another one. I never intended to have twelve short. Oh, 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 wow. Look at you. Is anybody going to fill? Who? Oh, they both fill. Wow, this thing's all over the place. Seven. I want to get down to five, I think. Let's see. Let's do another one there. Wow. I, I'm just so happy. Oh, look at that. Where did it go? Oh no, it went up. I thought it went down. I thought, wow. Take that away. Am I the only buyer? Who knows? All right, we'll take that. I just want to get down. Some ought to be able to pay attention. Okay, cool. So the Fed leaves their GDP forecast. Oh, GDP forecast unchanged. That's obviously not that good. Um, wow, this is so nice. I'm very pleased. It's great when I was. It's great when I forgot all about it too. <laughs> so their GDP forecast remains at 2.8 percent, which is unchanged from the last time. Uh, next year they're looking at. Um, wait, Fed raised their median forecast June. 2.8 percent. Next year 2.4 percent. 2022 percent. Long run GDP forecast 1.8 percent. These are not good. None of this stuff is good. So the Fed funds rate is 1.75 to 2%. That's up 0.25% from last time. Um, I, I'm now at the point where I'm more likely, if they shoot all the way back up to 2780, I'll probably just double down again. Okay. Uh, if it comes down low, if it comes back down to 40, I might, go, I might drop down to 4. But as it stands now, it looks like it's going to be bouncy. Anyway, let it do what it does. And But the, in the long run, this is not really a huge positive. Um, policy remains accommodative. Let's see what the statement actually says. Um, da, 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 da. FOMC statement. The Federal Reserve is used an FOMC statement on March 21st. That does us no good whatsoever. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, page not press releases is not found really. What is found? Uh, okay, related FOMC statement. Boom. <sighs> Let's see. Information received since the Federal Open Market Committee met in May indicates that the labor market has continued to strengthen. Economic activity has been rising. Accelerate job gains have been strong. Uh, unemployment rate is a so it all, it all says the same thing. This entire bit says the same thing. Recent data suggests growth of the household spending has picked up while business fixed investment has continued to grow strongly on a 12 month basis. Overall inflation, inflation for other items of food and energy moved closer to close to 2%. That's bullshit. It's over 2%. Um, indicators of longer term inflation expectations a little changed on balance. Consistent with his mandate, the committee seeks to foster employment, maximum employment price stability. The committee expects that further gradual increases in the rate for the federal funds will be consistent with sustained expansion of monetary activity. In other words, they don't think that raising rates is going to hurt the economy. Strong labor conditions and inflation near the committee's symmetric 2% objective over the medium term risks the economic outlook appear balanced. In view of realized and expected labor market conditions and inflation, see, so they're no longer worried about trade now because uh, that's all calmed down. So they're, they're, that was one of the things that was keeping them off the table. 
In view of realizing expected labor market conditions and inflation, the committee decided to raise the rate for the funds to one, one and three quarters to two percent. The stance remains accommodative. In other words, they consider this to be still accommodative. This is people are misreading this badly. They're not saying they are staying accommodative. They're this is like when your parents say, I'm going easy, you know, they punish you, but then say, we're going easy on you. That's what this is. They're not saying we're going to go easy on you in the future. They're saying, this is us going easy on you. Next time, maybe not. So thereby supporting strong labor market conditions and sustained return to 2% inflation. So they, they feel that they're still being accommodated, that rates are still too low. And they need to be tightened. That's a very clear message here that is being completely misread by all the uh, pundits that you're hearing on TV. In determining the timing and size of adjustments to target range for the funds rate, the committee will assess and realize blah, 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 blah. Same crap as always. The assessment will take into account a lot of stuff and will think about it really, really hard. And nobody dissented from the rate increase. That is also a sign more to come. All right, so this is not the end of it. This is uh, probably more like the beginning. All right, so thank you guys who were trying to tell me there was going to be a Fed thing, but when I'm looking at one thing, I can't see the other, so that's where we are. Oh, wait a minute. My phone is telling me. Uh, you don't want to hear it. Um, Antarctica's ice melt is increasing rapidly, a study finds rising sea levels are threatening coastal communities worldwide. Okay, so we got that to look forward to. Um, Federal Reserve hike maintains likely boosting the cost of credit cards. Federal Reserve raises interest rates for the second time. So two, probably two more hikes ahead. All right. So let's see. Um, uh, catching up. All right. So there we are on the Fed. I almost quoted on time, but I was getting sidetracked. Um, May. He says, Kyle, reg regarding LB, I just entered a long 2020-30 calls at 880 a day based on your write-up in the OOP last night. Is this one safe or should I trade out of it or do you expect more pullback or should I? <laughs> I started selling. Okay. <clears throat> oh, May. May, May, May. Okay. Um, so you see, you need to be in the PSW chat so you can have in-depth discussions of these things. Okay. Here's the thing. LB. Let's see if we can get to LB. See, I had to close the question box where I can't see these things. Um, so, yeah, we're low in the channel, but you seem to be taking a part of what I say. So you have 20, 20, 30 calls for 880. So you paid 3880 for LB and to 37, 36.72. So you are the sucker paying premium, $2 worth of premium. What we teach you to do is to go and is to enter into spreads like a bull call spread and have sell calls to offset the premium that you have. At least sell calls for two dollars to cover it. At least get that money back, the premium that you spent. Don't just buy a call and pay premium for a position. It doesn't make any sense. Why? Especially when you could turn it around the other way. And the only thing you're doing is capping your gains. There's nothing wrong with capping your gains. They're not really gains. You're fantasizing about your gains. They're not real. What's real is the money you're spending above the actual price of the stock. So, <clears throat> so you bought these guys for 880. In fact, there's, there's you, in fact. But look, you can sell the 30s, right? You can sell the $45 calls for 350. You can sell the 4250 calls for four bucks. So you paid two dollars in premium. If you sell one half, if you one half cover with the 4250 calls, 4250 is, is 20% higher than it is now. And if you sell one half of those for four bucks, the 4250 calls, what do you have? You have the same, you have half of your 30s are naked and they can go up as much as you fantasize about. But what you've also done is you've now you've now offset all of your premium. You've dropped your net cost on on your calls to 660. So your break even is right where the stock is now, 3660. And between here and 42, you gain every single penny of the gain on the, on your position. Then after that, you gain half of every single penny above that number. That's how we do it. As to selling puts, I generally sell puts if it, if it's low in the channel. And in this case, you have a, a tremendous upside 
even with a 30, 40, 250, you have 1250, you have 100% upside. So you don't need to sell puts. That depends on how much you want to really own LB for the long run. If you do want to own it, you could sell the $30 puts for another four bucks. And again, a half of that. And now you've dropped your cost to four to four sixty. And your break even is thirty four sixty. And you make and you're already weighing the money. And the and what's the worst thing that can happen to you is you get assigned to own LB at 30. So if you really, if you have a long-term portfolio, if you want to own long-term stocks, then all you're doing is promising to buy this one. In fact, I was just getting that discussion in the long-term portfolio. There's no penalty to that as long as you really have money laying around that says, well, I may as well put it in tail B. All right, so let's circle that back to the other discussion. But generally, I don't sell the puts unless if, if something's really low i'll sell some puts maybe a half sale or something like that i won't sell a lot of puts unless the position goes against me and i think the going against me is silly like when we sold our puts in lb uh which frankly i mean it's about the same price now but when we sold the puts in lb i was just like this is stupid these numbers are stupid it makes no sense that it should be this low therefore i'm going to sell more puts but that, that was a couple of bucks ago. That was when it was ridiculously low. Now, it's still low, but it's but as I said, we capped our gains at 35. We, we actually sold $35 calls to cover. We're done. This is, above our, this is above our target now. So I'm not going to tell you to sell puts above our target. You know, that's the point, though. We, the, the way we change our trades and the way we adjust our trades drops the target to such a ridiculously low level that it's, it, it's, it's almost ludicrous to say, how can you not make money on this thing? Oh, what was that trade? I forgot. There was some trade that's going to make it 100%. It was in the options opportunity portfolio review. It was some of the, one of the trades there was going to make 100%. Even, oh, I know what it was. It was uh, THC. The premiums are so ridiculous on THC that this spread that's like 100% in the money is still going to make 100%. It's still only priced at half of the total price of the spread. It's, it's so crazy. I'll show you guys that. That's a really nutty one. But that's, but that's our system. That's the point. It's, it's hard to see how you're going to lose when you have a 20, 35 bull call spread and the stocks are 36.50. I like to be in, spread, in trades that are hard to lose. I like to have things that are going to double if the stock stays flat. That's how I like to trade. Okay, I'm not, I, I'm not, it's not cowardly trading. I'm trading with a high percentage of success. I'm Ty Cobb. That's what I am. I'm, I'm the guy who tries. Ty Cobb was the greatest hitter of all time in baseball. He had a 367 lifetime average. Now, Generally, a guy hitting 300 is a star of the league. This guy hit 367 for his entire career, 20 years in baseball. More than one third of the time, he got up. He he went up to bat. He got on base. More than one third of the time that he got up to bat, he was the greatest hitter of all time. And what did he do? Did he did he swing for the fences? No. In fact, he was disgusted by home run hitters. He said, my job is to get a hit, and that's what I'm going to do as best I can. And he would try to get a hit. He would bunt. He would do. Uh, he would just try to hit it over the guy's head. He would look at the field and see where there was an opening and go for that opening. He didn't try to hit it past anybody. He didn't try to beat somebody. He didn't try to get it over the wall. He just tried to hit where he had the highest percentage chance of getting a hit. And he had great control. I mean, anybody can try to do that, but you have to also have the control. He had great control. And uh, was very and great reflexes, and he was also very fast, and he was able to do that at an incredible percentage, like like thirty, basically three sixty seven lifetime average. He was basically twenty percent better than the best players in the league. He's he's a running twenty percent better than the best averages of the best all time averages. Um. So that's how I approach trading. I would rather have a very high percentage of wins because the money will take care of itself. I don't need huge winners, and they, but they are huge winners, of course. But, <clears throat> you know, on a percentage basis, on a cash basis, they're not really huge winners because we don't risk a lot of cash. So even though it's a stunning return, it's like, oh, we made 500%. We only made 500% of only $2,000 that we risk. So it's, it's, it's $10,000. I don't go for those giant trades where I have 
where I pay $8 for a naked call and hopefully double it. I don't need to double it. I'd rather pay $6 or $4 for a covered call and double that because I have a much, much better chance of success playing the, playing the covered call than I do playing the, the, the naked call. And especially because when you buy that naked call, you are absolutely giving up $2. You're paying $2 more than the position is worth right from the start. So you have a $2 handicap. Why would I do that? So imagine telling, imagine telling Ty Cobb, we're going to give you, we're going to give you a, a one-hit handicap. We're going to give you one base handicap. We're going to make five bases on the field. So every time you go to bat, there's more. You have to run one extra base than everybody else. He'd be like, why would I do that? Why would I play that game? It doesn't make sense. And, and that's the most important thing I want to try to get you guys to learn. This is a whole thing about being the house and not the gambler. Learn not to be that person. Don't be the gambler. Don't pay the premiums. Sell the premium. Be the guy who collects the $2 from every single person. You be the person collecting the money. Let other people gamble. All right, so where are we? Uh, can you see another question? Uh oh, wait, May's still talking. She might have other information here. Reg LB trade. Uh, I'm not. I'm confused by the role of the 20 calls. My account cannot handle the larger premium. I'm not sure what I, that means because there's no reason you shouldn't be able to roll it. But again, if you're margin constricted, you shouldn't be making trades like that. That's just really tossing money away. Got to be real careful with that. You want to. It's a spread. You talk to your broker about how to execute it. But it's it's sometimes there's an order that you execute something that makes a big difference to these accounts. But they'll let you make a covered call. A covered call is a real basic thing. Um, it's just if you do it without one, if you do one thing before you do the other thing, before you do the other thing, that you have to get the order right. Fed raises sees uh, four hikes. Oh, is that the dot plot thing? Yeah. So that, that's why I figure four hikes. Um, oh, May says she has the 40 calls as a vertical debit spread. But like I said, we, we, we rolled the 40s down to the 35s to pick up some extra money too. Um, the short, I assume that is. I also sell the 20, 20, 45 calls at a high price. Again, it's so it's too out of the money now. Uh, the 20, 20, 45. Is it a realistic target? In other words, is it, is it going to go up 35%? It might, but uh, the 45s are three bucks and the uh, 35s are six bucks. So I would rather have three more bucks. I really would. I would rather have three more dollars in my pocket now and 10 less fantasy upside. That's how I play. I don't need to have fantasy upside when I have real upside consistently. I don't need to fantasize about one big winner because all my trades, you know, most of my trades are winners. Because I take conservative trades. If I take conservative spreads and I usually win, I don't have to worry. The money will come. Nothing has no big trade has to make up for it. And I'm not taking a big risk either because, you know, when the when it goes down, I'm protected also. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go selling the 35 puts. I would, I would really wait. If they pull back, then sell some puts and then adjust yourself down. Uh, just and, and again, if you're if you're tight on margin in your in your account, then selling puts is not going to help it. Uh, I just want to see if you think LB would continue to lower 30s as I literally took your LB trade of the year. Um, so she, you know, so you're in the trade, you like it. I, I'm saying here's the point: I would I would tighten it up, and I and lower your net cost of the trade, and I would also then wait and not sell puts unless they get more expensive. You know, I would I'd look to sell. I'd say I'd say look, I'll sell these. These are four bucks of 30 puts. The 35 puts are six something, 630. So that's a that's a 230 difference. So I'd say I'd want at least five. I'd want at least half of that difference. So on a 250 drop in LB, then I would sell maybe the 30 puts for five bucks because I consider net 25 a really good entry. 
I'm not net 25 is 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 25 30 percent below where we are now. So that's a great entry. And that's what I want with the short put. I want great entries. I don't want so so entries. I want great entries. John's got a little Ty Cobb reference thing. Yeah, he's incredible. Uh, and May says, I will now start to look monthly calls and LBs. You suggest to recoup the cost. Don't forget, it's like a one-third cover, not, not a full cover. How much higher percentage you sell those calls, i.e. straight price? I generally sell at the money. I want to sell as much premium as possible. And my attitude is, um, I think we sold the July 35s, right? So they're like at the money, or now they're in the money. But if you sell the July 35s for 260 that's 3760. We're at 3840. So half half of this call is premium that you're selling. So no matter what LB does, that premium will expire in in 37 days. So no matter what happens in 37 days, you get that dollar 30. If it goes higher, there'll be more intrinsic value, but either way. But then what you do to see if that's a good idea, you say, "Well, okay, looking ahead, what else is 250?" So the November 3750s are more than 250. The January 40s are about 250. Don't forget, you've got the 2020s. Well, there, there is nothing after that. Here, basically the 4750s in 2020 are 250. So the question is, do you think that LB is going to go higher than 4750? And as long as it doesn't go over 4750, then there's no reason not to sell the 35s because you can roll them eventually to the to the 4750s. Not only that, they'll be going to do one third sale if you roll a, to a double and have a two thirds coverage. Still not too much. Then then you can uh, then you can be at a much higher strike. In other words, and what's what's half of 250? What's a buck and a quarter? The January 45s or buck and a quarter. So is is LB going to be 45? By January, well, first of all, they'd have to earn three dollars a share, which we don't think they're going to do. That would be the high end of expectations. They then would have to have a PE of fifteen instead of twelve, which may happen, especially if they get back on track. So that's like really at the high end of what we expect. Is that we expect maybe they can get to that much? Oh, here's Powell's conference. Um, I'll check the headlines to see what he says. I don't think it's worth listening to. I mean, matters of course, because now he can say a lot of stuff that could move the market up or down. But uh, he's just starting to talk right now. So far, the Dow's down. The Dow is down like 66 points. Let's see what else is happening on the uh, on the indexes. Okay, so here's the movement so far. Nasdaq. I would. I'd like to see the Nasdaq down here, frankly. Oh, meanwhile, let's see here. The economy is doing very well, Powell says. Ooh, good for you, Jim. All you. All, all you. Wow, look at that. $5,000. We will take it. All right, so now I'm going to go to four. Start locking that in, right? Yes. Okay, so now I've got four, and it's bouncing off of this. It might go way lower, but I mean, I'm happy with 4000 bucks for a day. This is PL for the open, but that's because I've already taken a lot off the table. So the day is what matters right now. It's $4,450, $4,400. You know, I get to 5000 bucks, and that's my day's work. I, I kind of want to take it off the table, even though it might go lower. I'm like, you know what? I'll, you know, it's a lot of money. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm kind of done by the time it gets to 5000 I'm not really looking to make more. And and on the same token, but if we get down to $4,000, i am going to take it off the table because that's good enough. So, so anyway, so right now I'm kind of in between where I'm kind of thinking I would take it off the table. How's gasoline doing? Gasoline's uh, still bouncing up and down. But I tell you, futures is really fun. If you have a strong enough stomach for it, oh, it's going to blast through this and go to the, it's probably going to go down here. See, he's at the green line, and he's at the green line. He's below the green line. And who's missing? The Russell? TF. And the Russell is at the green line. So everybody's at the green line. 
except for the except for the Nasdaq. So we can hopefully see the Nasdaq down on that 7200 line again, which was our original shorting line. So we'll see what happens. But they're 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 the higher one right now. Oh, he's going up instead though. Oh, look at that. Son of a bitch. What a crazy index. Stop that. Taking my money away. So now I'm below 4,000. Bummer. But now back to 27, 28. It's all moving depending on whatever whatever Powell says this second, really. All right. So now that I had a nasty surprise and went below 4,000, I'm more inclined to start taking it off the table at 4,000. And I can always pick up something else as it goes below. But I'm not inclined to let it go much below where it is now. Unemployment. Oh, for God's sakes, these highlights on CNBC are a joke. Unemployment and inflation are low. So he's giving an economic recap. I want to hear what he's actually saying. Hang on a second. In May, its lowest level in nearly two decades. Meanwhile, the labor force participation rate has been roughly unchanged since late 2013. That is a positive sign. Oh, I'm already bored. Okay. I'm getting close to 4,000 again. 29, stable of 30. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, it's way down here. Oh, please. Ugh. All right, should I, should I be a wimp and get off get off the trade? What do you think? Uh, I think so. See, look, look at the Dow. Yeah, I'll take it. Disappointing now because I was hoping for five thousand, but we'll take what we get. Nothing's filling anyway. Look at this. So I have an I have an offer here and an offer here. Oh, and the higher one filled. All right, so now I'm getting annoyed. There goes that one. And we're out, hopefully. Oh, come on. There it goes. Okay, now I'm out. So now, now, I, can, now I can continue dropping. <laughs> but you see, everybody's bouncing off the green line, so the NASDAQ's going to bounce off. Of, it doesn't matter if it's not of the green line. The NASDAQ's going to bounce off its line. And so now we'll see how far they bounce. But on the whole, I don't see anything. Uh, growth outlook remains favorable. Inflation forecast for the Fed, 2.1% for the next three years with no change. Just 2.1. Every year they expect 2.1%. Although that is a raise from where they were. They, they didn't think that they were going to hit 2.1% this year. They were at 1.9%. So they've actually kind of raised their inflation outlook, which means, again, they lean towards more tightening. All right, so we'll, we'll analyze this better tomorrow when we have a chance to read everything. Um, but this, there's nothing hugely positive about this, but meanwhile, the markets will do what they'll do. All right, so what are we doing? Uh, oh, yeah, we were talking about something so important. Where were we? Strategy. No, not the strategy. The actual thing. Is that where we were? No, I know. Oh, we were at the point where we we're going to look at the portfolio. That's where we were. So here we are on the long-term portfolio. Basically, every month, we we pick a stock, and not every month. Well, I mean, obviously, we have eighteen in 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 six months, so that we do it more often. But we've been filling it up. But the point is. In general, at least once a month, we want to sell a put for somewhere something in the four to five thousand dollar range is my preference. Um, why? Because if I sell a four thousand dollar put twelve times a year, that's forty eight thousand dollars in a half a million dollar portfolio. So now I've collected ten percent of my entire portfolio by simply promising to buy things at a certain price. So that's what we do. 
So in other words, these are basically things that we intend on watching for the most part. Although in Berkshire's case, we decided to add more or whatever. But the point is, here we go. So we decide to uh, AL, uh, ALLY and we sold 10 for 270. So I'm promising to buy ALLY at 2650. I say, you know what, at 25, I'd like to buy it, but I'm going to sell the puts for 270. So I'm really buying it for 2230, aren't I? So at 2650, I say, you know what, if that thing goes down to 2230, if it drops almost 20%, I promise to buy it because I kind of like it. And I think that's a pretty good price. That's all I'm doing. Keep in mind it's a half a million dollar portfolio and I'm promising to buy $25,000 worth of 1,000 shares for 25 bucks if it gets cheaper. Not if it doesn't get cheaper. If it doesn't get cheaper, what happens? If it doesn't get cheaper, it stays above 25 and I keep the 2,700 bucks. So ideally, over the course of two years and 24 months, I will have sold roughly $100,000 worth of short puts. And every and it, it's, it rotates, it rolls around, but generally we're selling a year out. But since we sell them at different times, they're in different levels of degrading, right? So in other words, if I sold uh, last January, if I sold this January, 2020, then halfway through the year, then into next January, that thing is halfway degraded. The premium is half degraded on that position. If the position's on track, I might decide, and I feel safe about it, I leave it in there. It's no harm to me. If the position is not on track, I might make an adjustment. I might kill it. I might do a lot of things. We're always making that decision. We're always reevaluating them along the way. But for the most part, as you'll see, we're going to review these carefully. For the most part, you'll see there's nothing that you don't want. And we have the buying power for it. We've got um, uh, 300,000 in cash, so probably 600,000 in buying power sitting around. So it's not it's not a strain to buy any of these things. It's just a question of saying we're, we're doing it to collect the money. Because that money boosts our overall portfolio performance by 10% just for promising to buy stuff, just for saying, you know what, if that gets cheaper, I'll take a new position. So... Berkshire is at 190, and we sell the 170 put for 10 bucks. We sell the 165 for 10 bucks, so roughly 155, 160. We promise to buy it. It's at 190. That's 35 dollars less than 190. That's almost, again almost 20 percent below the current price. I'm I'm going to say I'll buy Berkshire Hathaway at a 20 percent discount. Oh, you know it's like oh wow, so brave, right? Um, that's the point though. I'm not being brave. I don't have to be brave. I'm getting paid to be conservative. I'm getting paid to be cautious with my portfolio. I like Berkshire Hathaway. I'd like to buy it, but you know what? He'll pay me, these guys are going to pay me $8,500 not to buy it. And I'll take that too. Okay. I like, I like, a, uh, I like a Mercedes convertible. It's $80,000, but someone will pay me $8,000 not to buy the Mercedes convertible. So, you know, I think of it that way. It's like, I know I want to buy the Mercedes convertible. I've got a car, perfect, I got a perfectly good Porsche. I'm happy with it. But I like the Mercedes convertible. It's a good summer car, and my car doesn't have a, a sunroof. It's a, it has a sunroof, but it's a, an SUV. Because um, I'm a dad, you know, I don't, I don't get to drive convertibles. <laughs> so that ends soon. My first order is going to college, so as soon as I get my freedom back, uh, I don't have to drive kids. I don't, have to, I don't have to buy a car based on how many kids it can hold. Um, so, you know, so I, I, I like the Mercedes convertible. I don't need it right now. I've got my car. But when my other daughter goes to college, I'm going to be like, hmm, you know what? Maybe I might get that Mercedes convertible. So I say, oh, it's $80,000. But meanwhile, I'm like, you know what? For $72,000, I would like to buy it. So I'll sell the 80,000, not even 72, I'll sell the $70,000 puts on the Mercedes convertible for $8,000. So I'm collecting 10% of the car's price in promising to buy it for a net 162, which is 20% below the current price. So where's the harm to me? I could easily get rid of my car. I could easily sell my car and get the Mercedes anytime. It's not going to hurt me. It'll piss my daughters off if I suddenly have a two-seater. 
<laughs> but it won't it won't hurt me at all. I'll be happy as a shark. I'll be happy as a clam. Um, so my worst case scenario is I get the car that I wanted for the price that I wanted. My best case scenario, and well, not my best case. My other case scenario is I don't get the car, but I get eight thousand bucks for doing nothing other than promising to buy the car if it's cheaper. That's all we're doing with stocks. Berkshire Hathaway has the same value as a Mercedes convertible. I know I want it. I like it. I want to have it in my collection. Okay, but I don't want to pay full price, so I'm going to offer to buy it for a discount. So here's a, a BX, it's Blackstone, Cheesecake Factory, uh, uh, CBT, uh, blah, 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 that is Cabot, um, Cleveland Cliffs, Canadian Bank of Commerce, uh, CVS, of course, Facebook, Gilead, GNC, GoPro, IBM, uh, KHC, C's, uh, uh, Signet, uh, AT&T, and Whirlpool. So all like, you know, based on my all, not GoPro or GNC, but, you know, top-notch companies generally, things that you absolutely can see yourself having in a 20-year portfolio, right? How much money did we raise selling these things? Promising to buy these 18 companies, 19 companies, <clears throat> we have been given, I'm, I'm going to do this fast, so it's, let's say it's uh, 10, 15, uh, 20, 23, 30, uh, 43, 48, uh, 58, 68, another, let's call it 79 and 5, 79, 85, so about $85,000. <clears> so, so far this year, we've sold about $85,000 worth of puts promising to buy a bunch of stock now we're, obviously we're not we're not likely to have to we're not likely to end up buying them all and in fact look like the cheesecake factory one's already worthless we can buy that back and close it out and that's the thing see now when i when i close out <clears throat> when i close out the cheesecake factory i open up a spot to, to sell something else right if we now opened up an allocation block to sell something else that one's run its course overall um, why is that? That's because it's a short term. It was only a July put that we sold in Cheesecake Factory. Um, overall, the gain so far is uh, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7, 8,000. Um, uh, minus uh, is uh, back to 7,000. Still 7,000, call it 10,000. Uh, those don't, that doesn't matter. Um, 11 and a half, 12 and a half, 13 and a half, 12 and a half. 13, 13 and a half, 14, 15, and another half. So call that 16, let's say 16,000. So out of so our $80,000 worth of short puts that we've sold so far are up $20,000 so far. Some are up, some are down. Generally though, because we sold premium and selling premium is always smart, we've collected 25% and it makes sense because we're 25% through our holding period. Our holding period is almost entirely two years, right? 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, you know, see mostly 2020s. So our holding period is two years. We're one quarter of the way through and we've made one quarter of the money we expect to make. Why is that? Because premium always expires worthless. It's a mathematical fact. It's a it's a scientific fact. It's an options fact. Premium expires worthless. So if you sell eighty thousand dollars worth of premium in six months, if you sell eighty thousand dollars worth of two year premium in six months, twenty thousand dollars worth of it expires. And since the market hasn't gone down, most of these stocks haven't gone down. So in a flat market, in a flat market, I know I'm going to make. $20,000 a quarter without doing anything. I'm making 10% of my entire portfolio a year just for promising to buy stocks at a lower price than they are now. Imagine if you had bought every stock you ever bought this way. How long have you been trading? 10 years, 20 years? 
Every 10 years, it adds 100% to your portfolio. This simple little thing to adjust your trading, instead of buying everything now, you discipline yourself to always have a rolling number of short puts. Now, keep in mind that if the market does tank, you have to buy these things. I have to buy a thousand shares of Annaly. I have to buy four, nine hundred shares of Berkshire. I have to buy a thousand shares of BX. I have to buy five hundred shares of Cheesecake Factory. Five hundred shares of Abbott. You've got to have this money, or you've got to have a plan for what you're going to do. Now, we of course have our hedges in the short-term portfolio that will pay us a big wad of cash if the market goes down. We already we already up seventy-five thousand dollars in the short-term portfolio. That money goes towards buying these puts if we have to. And as the market goes down, we need to evaluate them. We don't let them all go to hell. We don't let ourselves get forced to buy them all. But you have to realize you could wake up tomorrow. There could be a twenty percent market crash. So you better. You know, Kim Jong-un could, could say, ha ha, nuke Washington tomorrow. You know, so you better have a plan for what you're going to do in a disaster. So you don't want to overdo it. But I find generally these are these are what we call palatable. Notice that it it's depends on the amounts, too. The IBMs, <clears throat> IBM just sold five. It's a $100 stock. Um you know, a hundred dollar stock for for a CM here, a hundred and twenty dollar stock for Facebook here, a sixty dollar stock we sell ten of, a ten dollar stock we sell twenty of. Notice they're all similar in size. Berkshire, we actually, you know, been a little crazy, but it's freaking Berkshire Hathaway. Of course, I want it. <laughs> you know, I I'm willing for Berkshire Hathaway to be ten percent of my portfolio if it gets that cheap. If it goes below the point where Warren Buffett wants like buys it himself. But, you know, in a bad crash, we would have to start cutting back some. We'd be able, we'd, what we'd have to do is take a loss on some and, and buy others and say, that we don't, like, definitely I want Berkshire, but I don't want, you know, but I'm not going to risk, uh, you know, CVS or something like that. You know, depending on, depending on what happens at the time, why we crash, so on and so forth. Um, Powell says the economy is doing very well. Inflation and unemployment are low. Are they just keep rolling the same crap? Like they don't actually say what he's saying? Anyway, all right. Very, very key core strategy in the long-term portfolio. And in a positive market, we're a little more aggressive with our put selling. We don't see any particular reason the market's going to crash hard. Might, might pull back, but not crash. And that means that all these things are generally going to be pretty safe. Um... Then we have covered calls. These are all the dividend paying stocks. We wouldn't own a stock if it didn't pay a dividend generally. Although Frontier doesn't pay a dividend now, but we hope they will again sometime. Um, and then these are the regular stocks or the regular spreads that we have plenty of. Um, as I said, we got like 30 something. There's a lot, 34. No. It's more than I, it's more than I generally like to have, but it, again, it's, there's so many. Things that we were able to pick up cheaply, uh, we got good prices on this year that there's no reason not to have it. And, and I, I try to cut back. I always look at them and say, which ones can we cut back? But they're all so good. These are freaking great positions. Um, where's our short-term portfolio review? Um, yesterday. Yes. Oh, yesterday we did the options opportunity portfolio. So let's look at that. Oops. Shouldn't click that. Uh, da, 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 da. There's the boys. Uh, okay, so here's the OOP review. And I'll give you an idea, okay? So uh, you can't look at the positions at the same time, but I'll just show you what we do. Um, here we have not as many short puts. Wait. Hmm. Now, we, we, because of the margin issue in the short-term portfolio, we don't really do the short puts because it's we just don't have enough... Uh, uh, margin room in it otherwise i like to but but at this stage when the short-term portfolio starts gaining like we we start out very conservative in the short-term portfolio and i know it's tedious because we're only making 10 percent, 15 percent, whatever um it's because it's a small portfolio you can't afford to take the losses 
But these positions are very strong positions, and they're going to make $140,000 if you leave them alone and the, and the market stays up. So you don't need exciting gains. You just need to stay on track. That's a very important point about the short about the about the options, not the short term, the options opportunity portfolio. These positions right here, this exact positions, will make one hundred and forty thousand dollars if they are successful by twenty twenty, by January twenty twenty. That's a hundred percent gain in two years. So I, I don't need to do much other than make sure they're going the way they're supposed to go. So in our review, SQQQ is a hedge. And we make an adjustment there. Apple, we're not worried about that at all. Is what I was talking about where they said, like, the, the LTP is the same way. We're not worried about any positions. They're all great. Um, CBI is now MDR. And we have special, I'll show you what we have in MDR. <clears throat> it hasn't officially come through from the broker yet. Oh, see, they're crashing now, so I can get back in on this guy. I want to get a couple. One. Come on. Oh, you bastard. Look, as soon as I try to do it. Yeah, yeah, come on. You know you want it. <laughs> yeah, come on. Go, go, go. Yes. <laughs> All right. So now everybody else is turning down but the NASDAQ. So I want to get back in my NASDAQ shorts. I want to have a couple. I don't want to miss out on the fun if it starts totally crashing. <clears throat> what was I looking for? Oh, I was going to show you on MDR. Yeah. Man. So much stuff going on. So um, you see these? This is what we have now. Um, so we still have the 15 puts, these. We still have the short 15 puts. The CBI, they were CBI, now they're MDR. But they've got this weird 77, they're, they're worth 77 of 100, not full price. And they're, um, and also there's 231 cash to offset it. So in other words, really we have to be below, well, I'm sorry, they break even at 15. So it, see, so if, they, if, if MDR is above 15, they go worthless. But if they're in the money, they also carry $2.30 per contract cash portion. That's why they're so expensive, um, because if it goes below, you owe that money plus the uh, money that from the uh, from the um, merger. So that's where we are. We we have these MDR 15s now that are weird, as opposed to the re MDR doesn't even regularly have any 15s this far out in time. So these are our these are our contracts right here, the ones that have the yellow and are kind of strange. Um, the problem is Power Options doesn't recognize them yet, so I can't change anything yet. Anyway, all right, it's China Mobile on track. <clears throat> TZA is another hedge. FTR had a nasty pullback, but it's on track because we only were looking for eight bucks. Uh, ABX, right where it started, good for a new trade. ALK on track. BBY, good for a new trade. CDE is on track. CG is on track. CHK is on track. Finally, because it was way the frick down here and people were freaking out. And I was like, wait, I mean, you know, it's like you can't expect something to go up. It doesn't matter how much you know something is, is is worth more than people think it is. If they don't think it's worth it, it's not going to go up. Um, here's the rest of the portfolio. Ford is on track. FNSR is on track. FNSR is still good for a new trade. It's crazy low. Uh, GE is still good for a new trade. As I said, $14 GE is, is silly. GNC coming back finally. Oh, no, is that today? Wow, another nice game today. Um, HBI is on track. HMNY, okay, we're going crazy on that one. This one's been terrible, but we're buying 5,000 more shares at 38 cents. Um, in, in, in the Phil Stockwell chat room, we've talked about this. I, I think HMNY is like Sirius Satellite was, S-I-R-I, um, when they paid Howard Stern $50 million to come and join them it was more money than they had they had to sell stock and dilute to pay him and that was his annual contract people were like that you can't pay one guy 50 million dollars when you usually pay a dj 
a, a million dollars. You can't pay one guy 50 times what you pay. You're, you're more than you're paying for your whole staff. You're paying one guy. And uh, they, they thought it was super important to get him. Uh, they, they were right because when they got Howard Stern, people started taking serious much more seriously. They got a ton of his people came over and subscribed. Who you know, just for the purpose of getting Howard Stern. I mean, he, the Howard Stern listeners were like, "I want to listen to Howard Stern." He's no longer on the regular radio. They paid whatever it is, ten bucks, twenty bucks a month to have Sirius. Um, so that got them millions of subscribers. It killed XM, so they were able to merge with XM. But meanwhile, you know, when they were actually doing it, everybody's like, "They're going to go bankrupt. They got no money. They, they're giving this guy a contract that stocks like eleven cents at the time." Um, they, they diluted the crap out of it to raise money, but they were just following through on the plan that they were sure was going to work. And that's what, that's what Helios and Matheson is doing. They're following through on their plan with movie pass that they are sure is going to work. And I've looked at their plan and I, I feel good about it too. I think they're onto something and maybe they pull it off and maybe they don't. And maybe we're going to lose a lot of money. But you know what? We might make a fortune on this play. Like with Sirius, we made like 10 times our money on Sirius in the end. Because it just flew up. Once the money started rolling in, once the turnaround took over, it took a year. But you know, hey, it took a year. What are you going to do? It's not going to fix instantly. Even though I was sure this was going to work, what Sirius was doing was going to work. I was positive it would work. I, you know, I, again, I, I listen to Howard Stern. I know how people follow him, um, but not only that, but the whole concept of, of what Sirius said is they said, you know what, people follow the DJs because that's what's important to them. The fact that Howard Stern was in 20 markets on regular radio and, and killing other DJs in all the markets that he was in. Um, the fact that Rush Limbaugh was all over the place and people like that, Opie and Anthony, things, uh, they were all these megastar DJs. And when they were good, they would put it in market after market after market. So uh, Mel Carmison from Sirius, his idea was he's saying, hey, we got to do this. We got to get these guys. He goes, he, he goes, it doesn't matter if you if you want people to tune into your radio, you need the guys people want to tune into. It's not a complicated concept. So Movie Pass is saying, hey. We want we if we can control this audience, if we can get five million people to subscribe by making a dirt cheap prop thing that we actually lose money on. If we can get five million people to subscribe, we get to the point where we're so powerful that we can send our five million people, and don't forget their friends and their dates and whoever, but we can send our five million people to see a movie and give it a fifty million dollar box office boost opening day by just controlling five million people that sounds like it makes sense to me if it would, it would be illegal manipulation these guys can manipulate the box office of major motion pictures they can turn anything they want into a hit they can turn a hit into a bigger hit for smaller movies, they can cover the entire cost of making a movie. So they've already gone past that step. And Helios is saying, well, we're going to then produce movies. So they've taken over a movie production outfit. And, and one that makes uh, uh, cheapy kind of films like, uh, I forget the name of it now, Escape, or Escape something. Some prison escape movie with Sylvester Stallone. I don't remember what it is. But uh, the point is they, have, they, they, they make these movies. That are like, oh, Sylvester Stallone escapes from prison. You know what that costs? It costs Sylvester Stallone's salary and a bunch of extras and renting a prison for the weekend. It's like a twenty. You know, it's like a twenty-five million dollar movie. If they can send fifty million people, if they can send fifty million dollars worth of people to a twenty-five million dollar movie, they make twenty-five million dollars as a production house. Then there's international, and because it becomes a hit here, international sales, DVD, blah 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 blah. Now nobody in China is going to look at the box office of the prison escape movie and go, oh, well, you know, it hit $75 million in the U.S., but we're not going to count that because uh, it's a movie pass movie and people send their people there. Now, over time, that might happen because eventually it'll get abused. But as a general plan, it's brilliant. 
So it's like, yeah, we're going to lose some money selling on the tickets because we're sending people only paying $10 a month. And if they see two movies a month, we lose some money and whatever. But if they make half that money back just on the initial box office sales through their movie company, and if they then make more money, ad sales, international sales, distribution, TV rights, blah, 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 blah. If they start doing that, suddenly the whole thing makes sense. But they can't prove that tomorrow. They can, they can prove it to the guys who are investing. They've got Verizon putting in 10%. They've got some other guys putting in big money. they got some Hollywood studios getting interested. You can, you can prove it. as a, you, can say, you can say to movie guys, hey, that's an interesting idea. Let's do that. Um, once they prove this model works, people are going to line up for this crap. And it's going to get really interesting. And once they once they prove they can move their five million people from one place to another and get them to see shows, their movie theaters are suddenly going to start giving them discounts and everything else. And all of a sudden, it won't be so such a loser trip for it. So anyway, the bottom line is, I see what they're trying to do. I understand the difficulty of doing it. I'm willing to give them a lot of breathing room to get it done. If it goes down to ten cents from where it is now, I'll buy more. I'll dollar cost average down because it doesn't cost anything. We're, we're in for like a $7,000 loss already. It is way lower than I thought it would be. But so we're going to buy more. And you know what? It doesn't cost much more now. Every time we make a mistake, it's no big deal. 5,000 shares is 1,900 bucks. The next 5,000 we buy is going to cost us 1,000 bucks. And the next five and the next 5,000 after that, we probably buy, actually we probably buy 10,000 for another thousand bucks after that to double down. And we'll end up with four with 20,000 shares of movie pass when it's down at like a dime. And yeah, we'll be behind, but we'll have 20,000 shares of movie pass. And if it ever goes back to a dollar, we're going to make a fortune. So I'm, I'm, I don't care if it doesn't go up right now. It's a great opportunity on a penny stock where sometimes, you know, sometimes you got to give it a shot. And I like the occasional gamble like that. It's fun. Um, HRB, <laughs> that's funny. It was deep in the money now, just like yesterday. And now it's, uh, now, now it's out of the money. Um, IMAX, uh, also, I said, all it takes is one big film. Solo didn't do well. And this is what happened to IMAX. And I'm like, they didn't make the film. <laughs> and even more insulting is Disney went up. That makes no sense. It's like Disney made the film and, and their stock went up. And IMAX went down because uh, Solo didn't do well. There, there's Disney. They went down first, but they recovered already. But somehow IMAX is, is suffering for it. So it's really stupid. But, you know, look, stupid reactions to stocks is how we make money. So IMAX, again, is a great play right here. LB, I said our sleepy stock of the year is back on track. NAK, uh, Wild Ride, we're, we're getting more aggressive on NAK. It's another penny stock, and we'll see how they do. Uh, NLY, we're waiting for them to go high before we sell calls. SunPower took a big dive, but we are getting more aggressive here. We brought back the 20 calls. In fact, they're, they're popping today again. And again, why is it selling off tariffs and trade laws and things like that, all this bullshit? But the bottom line is they're a great company. They make great solar cells, and they've got great growth potential. I don't care what's happening right this minute. I care about the long run. And the long run is a $10 stock. Um, oh, here's a THC, which is really silly. Tenant Healthcare, right now, you can take this trade right now. We we got in this trade for 10,000 minus 58, so 4,000 minus, minus almost 4,000. We got in this trade for like 500 bucks. 525, oh, there it is. So we got, we got in this trade for $525 net. The spread is eight times 15, it's a $12,000 spread. And we got in it for five hundred dollars. So our upside is eleven thousand four hundred seventy-five dollars, whatever. Um, at twenty, the stock's at thirty-seven. That's almost double our target. Our target was twenty, and and it's already at thirty-seven. Yet the net of the spread is only thirty-nine sixty-five. That's crazy.
So it's, you know, so so you could still get the spread and make a double off it. It's, I mean, some of these numbers are just nutty when you look at them. Um, VRX also way over our target now. We had a 22 target. We're very, see, this is the thing. I have very conservative targets and we make them. But, and then you look at your portfolio, you say, well, there's nothing to do. You just wait till, till you get all your premium back. There's, there's really nothing to do but hang out and watch the premium come in. WPM, this is our third time playing last year's trade of the year. Unlike LB, well, I'm not unlike LB because the, the, the WPM had a lot of work, this wheat and precious metals. Unlike LB, wheat and precious metals has always hit a target on time. That's the difference. LB, it, go, it went up and down like LB. Let me show you wheat. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Here. WPM. So wheat and precious metals is just like LB. It goes from 21 to 19 to 22, back to 19, back to 22. Okay. LB, same thing. It goes from, from 35 to 60, back to 35, going to be back to 60. You know, it's the same crap. Only L WPM tends to hit it right when we want it. You know, every time we get in and out of it, it's perfect. Like we got out in December and then it crashed and then we got back in and now it's going back up. It's perfect for us every time. LB, not so much. LB is on a sort of like a weird, a weird schedule. So we have to be careful with it. Um, but also this is the third time we've, we've made money. It's the third time we've made a huge amount of money on the same play. Basically, we just keep we keep getting in when it's 19. We keep getting out when it's 22. That's how we've been playing this thing. And we and I'm not I'm not ashamed. I'll do the same trade over and over again if it's going to make that kind of money. I mean, look at this thing. It's up five five thousand something dollars in uh, what is this four months? And we started out with uh, six thousand bucks. So it's basically we're almost a double already. The potential. Is uh, the potential is only five thousand bucks. So I think actually we're going to kill this. We are going to have to kill this trade. I didn't. I didn't call it here, but we're, we're basically full on this because it's only a five thousand dollars spread. We got the. Oh no, it's not. I'm sorry, it's a ten thousand dollars spread. Ah, I'm wrong. It's a fifteen twenty five spread. So we we are going to keep it because it's not. It's not quite cooked yet. It's halfway there. But oh, here's another one though, right? It's a, it's 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 mostly in the money. It's seven bucks in the money. So it's seven thousand dollars in the money. Actually, oh, I'm sorry, it's more than that because we have twenty calls. We aren't fully covered. Eh, it's going to be a good play. But even if it was ten, we'd be, you know, we'd we'd be mostly in the money and so cheap. It's still just so cheap to buy because the premium is so much on this thing. So I said, look, we're well balanced. It's the options opportunity portfolio. The, unlike the uh, the long term portfolio is hedged by the short term portfolio. The the options opportunity portfolio is self hedging. It was $100,000 to start portfolio. It's not that much higher now. It's only about $115,000. Um, but these positions overall have $140,000 upside potential to them. So if we do nothing and they just keep doing what they're doing, over the next 18 months, they're going to make about an average of $10,000 a month or a little bit like $8,000 a month on the average. And as long as they stay on track, that's what we're going to expect out of it. So, you know, we'll adjust when we have to. We'll make changes when we have to. But, you know, we tinker with it. But hopefully, if you have a good mix and a well-balanced portfolio, you don't have to do much with it. There's not a lot of pressure. All right. Let's uh, a few final questions. We're way over time. Look at that. Let's say. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Okay, not too many extra questions, so we can wrap this up. Rich says, can you explain the logic in the STP review to end up with IQ in 100 short? What? Uh, I, I didn't say that in the STP review. I hope I didn't. What are we talking about? All right, we just did the short-term portfolio review, so I'm going to go home. I'm going to check on that. Oh, I know what you're saying. Okay, IQ. Okay. Uh, 
there's no quick way to explain it. Okay, we had an IQ play. We had 20 spreads and we had five short calls and it exploded higher. So we made kind of like a fortune, obviously, on the, we made a fortune on this call. But now we have all these short calls that we have to do something with. So there were 25 of them. So what we decided to do was to cash in these calls because we made a huge amount of money. Okay, they were originally um, 23.6, and we sold them for 45.2. So we picked up 20 plus thousand dollars on that, 22,000 bucks. Um, so now we're left with the naked call. So we took the 50 that we had, took the 25 that we had, and we rolled them. And what we rolled them to is we rolled 20 uh of these 2250 short calls to a year to to a year sooner the january one year sooner 35 calls so we rolled them up to the 35s and doubled them and cut a year off the timing then we rolled these five 2250 calls to 10 of the january 35 calls so now we have 50 short january 35 calls okay now, those are naked because we already cashed out our longs. So now we've got to cover the short calls. So how are we going to protect the short calls? We're going to, in this case, instead of buying just long calls, we're going to buy a bull call spread, not just buy calls. We're buying a bull call spread. So we have 50 long and 50 short, 25, 40 bull call spreads. That's a $15 spread that we're buying for, um, uh, well, 15, it's a $75,000 spread. 50 times, uh, 50 times 15 is $75,000. No, I'm sorry. 50 times 15, yes it is, it's $75,000. So it's a $75,000 spread we're buying for $25,000. So we have $50,000 worth of upside coverage against the 35 calls that are basically exactly in the money. So he's saying, why are we selling 100 calls? Well, we're selling 50 calls as part of the spread and 50 calls as the naked calls, short. So why are we doing it? Because we think that they'll probably expire worthless or that we'll be able to roll them out of trouble. We have coverage that will pay us $50,000 if IQ hits 40. IQ's currently at about 35. Hang on, take a look. Um, IQ. What's that number? I see. I'm gonna move your box. 35. So IQ is right at 35. I think they're overpriced now. So we have the spread covering just in case I'm wrong and it keeps going up. We're gonna make fifty thousand dollars. Now, how do we lose fifty thousand dollars? Well, it has to be over forty-five before we lose fifty thousand dollars. And if that starts happening, we would change our coverage. So before we have to pay 50,000 back to the short callers, they have to be over 45. Anything under 45 is gonna be a profit for us. So that's why we like that spread. So yeah, we're not selling, I, we, well, I don't look at it as selling 100 short calls against 50 long calls. I'm saying we're selling 50 short calls against a 50 call spread that pays us $50,000 if those short calls go in the money. So all, what, what the gist of the bet is, is I'm saying, I don't think I'm going to have to pay these guys $50,000. So that, that's essentially what the bet is now, is that between now and the end of the year, I don't think they finish higher than 45. And as long as they don't finish higher than 45, we get a net profit out of, this, out of the total spread. Plus, we've already put a lot of money back in our pocket on the trade. Do you still like gold and would you short silver? We just called gold long today above the 1300 line. I would never short silver. I don't know where you ever got that. Um, we we got out of silver at 17 because we think it's high enough, but it's I'm not shorting it. I'm very bullish on silver and gold. Uh, gold has been lagging silver by quite a lot. So today, this morning in chat, we called along on, on gold. It's not a short on silver. Oh, that, oh, that's working out too. See, it's up two bucks since we called it. Um, so my, my logic was I said, look, silver's up at 17. Well, I wasn't shorting it. I'm just saying silver is up at 17. 
And, and don't forget, Wheat and Precious Metals is a silver trader. So that's, that's why, again, why we like them. But I said it was way behind gold because if you move to a longer form chart like daily, look at that. That's, that's what I'm talking about. So this morning I said, wow, I'm not going to go long on silver here because it's already at 17. But look at gold. It's so far behind. This makes a really good long. So now, so, so now gold's up two bucks already from where we entered this morning. Boy, we're killing it this morning on the trades, huh? Den says he can't hear me. I'm on mute. I hope not. I think that's you. Um, well, I'm sorry. Somebody tell him that, but we're uh, unfortunately ending the thingy. Uh, last question from three. How would you do HRB as a new trade idea? Ugh. Why does your last question have to be a hard one? Um, I think, first of all, I give it a day or two to see what happens. But, um, you know, at 24 bucks, okay, I, you know how I do it as a new strategy? I would start by selling the $23 puts for $3.50 uh, because that nets you in for 19 bucks. So that's step one is sell the short puts. Step two, you keep your eye on the spread. And if you look at like the 20, I'm trying to see if I would pay the extra money, four bucks or six bucks. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't pay two bucks to move down three bucks. Um, this one's three bucks, one buck. I would pay, I would pay, it's not even one buck. I would pay one buck to move down two bucks. I wouldn't pay two bucks to move down three bucks. So I like the 23s for four bucks and you can sell the, the 30s. No, nah, I wouldn't even sell the 30s. Eh, yeah, okay, I would. Okay, sorry. So the 2330 spread is what I'd keep an eye on. And that's roughly $2, maybe, maybe 220. So Obviously, sell these for, for 350. And then if you sell half of these for 350, and then anytime, as long as you don't pay more than like 250 for this spread, you can pick up the spread when you feel more comfortable. And that's how I do it as a new trade. All right. Oh, she, <laughs> she says you rock. Love you. Thank you. All right. So that's gonna be it, guys. I hope everybody can still hear me. Well, I guess three can because she said thank you. Um Everybody have a lovely day. We'll do it again next week and uh, enjoy yourselves, okay? And be careful because I still think we're going to turn sharply lower eventually from all this Fed stuff. All right, have a good day, everybody.